Hey, well, hello everyone. Welcome to our webinar. Welcome to the Neil Hickson Center for Climate and the Environment with Professors Tom Donnelly and Lilia Hawkins. My name is Vanessa Chu, Assistant Director in the Office of Alumni and Parent Relations. We thank you for attending today's event and we hope you're very excited. Please feel free to type your questions in the Q&A box, not the chat, and we'll try to get through as many as possible. Now, I'm gonna turn it over to our speakers to introduce themselves. Lilia and Tom, the floor is yours. Hi, thank you so much. Uh, I'm Lilia Hawkins. I am the director for the Hickson Center for Climate and the Environment. I am in my 12th year as a faculty member at Harvey Mudd College, and I have very much enjoyed working with students here in the chemistry department and across the college doing research in atmospheric chemistry and the intersection of chemistry and climate change. Um, so we will start with a campus update and then we'll talk about the new Hickson Center. So I'm going to turn things over to Professor Tom Donnelly to lead us off. Good afternoon or good evening, depending on what part of the country you're in right now. Thank you very much for joining us. Um, I'm Tom Donnelly. I'm starting my 26th year at the college. I'm currently the Dean of the Faculty and I came up through the physics department and I study high power laser matter interactions, high power lasers or short pulse lasers interacting with ma uh, matter and applications towards fusion in particular. So uh, before we get to Lilia and all the really exciting stuff with the Hickson Center, I wanted to spend a couple of minutes giving you some updates on what's happening around campus right now to give you a sense of what we're doing at the college. So the first one is the honor code. So Harvey Mudd has a very strong tradition of the student-run honor code. And one of the uh, many downsides of pandemic for us has been the absence of students on campus in this sort of person-to-person uh, -person contact and tradition sharing and lore sharing about the cultures and traditions of the college. And one of those is the honor code. Every student who comes to the college signs the honor code and uh, many students come in part because they understand the honor code to be so important to the operation of college. But the prominence of the honor code as part of our culture and sort of day-to-day uh, -day activities has been somewhat diminished by the presence of uh, the pandemic and people's absence from the campus. And so we're spending this year uh, reinvigorating our discussions and thinking and talking about the honor code. So that's, uh, we started a convocation with keynote addresses on the honor code for having uh, honor code day in some of our classes. We're gonna have alumni come back and talk about the importance of the honor code while they were at Harvey Mudd, et cetera. So we're, um, we're excited about that and looking forward to those discussions this year. We have, uh, we will welcome six new faculty to the college this year. You see here um, who those folks are. We have people in chemistry, physics, engineering, um, and the humanities and social science and the arts department. In addition to these six who are coming, who will join us at different times this year, we are in the process right now of searching for 11 tenure track positions for the coming year. So this year, the way the academic hiring cycle works, we spend this academic year searching hopefully for people who will start next academic year. So a year from now in the fall of 2023, we have three searches that will go on in the computer science department, three in the engineering department, one in mathematics, one in humanities, social sciences and the arts, one in physics, and two in the Hickson Center to support um, our hope for new joint major programs. We also have a presidential search underway. Our presidential search is in high gear. Um, we have, uh, Maria Clave will be finishing her 17th year at the college at the end of this year. She'll be stepping down in the middle of the summer and we're in the process of finding her replacement. So uh, almost certainly by the beginning of the spring term, we will have a name and a person who will be replacing Maria. Uh, the process is ongoing, so you can't guarantee that. You never know exactly how the chips are gonna fall. But um, we have a very, very strong applicant pool and we're in the process of um, trying to get that down to one very special person who will replace Maria and help lead us into a great future. And we have our new arrivals this year. So not so new now, they're beginning their fourth week of classes. So they, they've sort of figured out where the cafeteria is. They know where their room is. They know how to get to some of the other college campuses. They probably know where the gym is and that kind of stuff. And hopefully their classes. Uh, we had 238 first-year students, as you can see, including, well, in addition to six transfer students, this is, we had our second largest applicant pool in the history of the college, which is very exciting. 
We have maintained um, significant racial and ethnic diversity and increased also our socioeconomic diversity with this incoming class. So it's a group we're really excited about. So thank you for being here. Thank you for supporting the college. Thank you for your interest. And with that brief set of updates, I will pass it over to Lilia. All right, thank you, Tom. So um, I'm really excited to share with you the current state of things at the Hickson Center for Climate and the Environment. This is our campus home for all of our efforts related to teaching climate change, including climate science, sustainability efforts, and broader environmental work on campus. We are a student-focused institution, and so that means that the primary work of the Hickson Center is to facilitate learning for our students both inside and outside the classroom. I like to highlight some photos of students doing work with faculty um, and so here we have shark tagging in Costa Rica with Professor Chris Clark in our engineering department. And then in the center photo, two of my students from this summer as we traveled to Paris, France to do some work, um, some field work in atmospheric chemistry. And then on the far right, we have a student, um, that's a senior from last year, Anandi Williams, presenting her senior thesis work at the American Chemical Society Conference, where our students um, typically at many conferences are presenting not in the undergraduate sessions, but in the main session, um, which is where they belong. So under the Hickson Center umbrella, we have a number of programs. We are hiring new faculty. We have two searches ongoing, as Tom mentioned. We are hiring those faculty um, to expand our ability to offer courses in these uh, areas of climate and the environment, but also to support planned new joint major programs, uh, potentially one with, which e with each of our major granting departments. We also have support for our existing faculty because we have a number of faculty who would like to um, open, uh, open a new area of research, learn something new in this field as it intersects with their field and incorporate that into their courses. We also house the HMC Emphasis in Environmental Analysis, which um, students can choose to pursue while they're at Harvey Mudd. It's a smaller footprint than a minor. It's more like a concentration, and that is facilitated through, um, through our program as well. And lastly, we coordinate with all the other campus-wide efforts on environmental engagement, including campus sustainability efforts. So those are, there are a number of places where those things occur within the facilities and within student, student body, um, but we are involved in those conversations as well. One of the central programs that the Hickson Center is launching is our solutions-focused climate change program. And this relates to courses individually, but also to the planned structure of the joint major programs. So in this climate change program, we are hoping that students will learn basic earth system science that you would imagine students would learn in a climate science course or set of courses, but also importantly, um, it's, it's solutions focused. And so we're thinking about what are the technological tools and broader solutions that students might find themselves applying in their careers and in their lifetime, because we want to be forward looking. Um, we want students to understand the basic physical principles of what's changing in our climate system, but that's not enough. They need to be empowered to work on these problems toward a solution. And then lastly, because of the structure of our curriculum, we have, um, you know, it's not quite a third, but a large uh, a fraction of our curriculum is dedicated to the humanities, social sciences, and the arts, regardless of what a student is majoring in. And so this is a perfect opportunity to leverage the additional breadth that these students get through our HSA programs toward a solutions-focused climate change program. And lastly, one of my favorite things about this focus is that it's inspiring for our students. It's uh, sort of an antidote to eco-anxiety. I don't know if uh, if any of your students uh, feel this way, but I certainly know the feeling and it makes a difference in the classroom when we um, when we have this this aspect to the instruction. So uh, one of the common questions that we get from students, parents, alumni and um, other friends of the college is, you know, what will students do with this education, whether it's a few courses or a joint major or something or something else? And um, we put together a list of possible career paths that students might take that are inspiring. So you can imagine students working in urban planning for climate resilient cities, thinking about adapting for sea level rise or heat 
heat waves um, or smoke. They can work in clean energy technology or it may be a material science thinking about plastics and recovery of plastics from the environment. Uh, there's a lot of work and a lot of funding being put into atmospheric carbon dioxide removal, both through natural mechanisms like habitat restoration, but also technological solutions, carbon capture. Um, there's important work to be done in intelligent power systems, which connects a lot with um, AI and other tools from computer science. Remote sensing. So we have a lot of information about the Earth from, uh, from satellites, but there's a lot to be improved in the retrieval algorithms, for example, estimating sea level rise and projecting that. And lastly, students will be well prepared to go on to graduate school if they wish in climate science itself um, from a program like this. This student that's highlighted on the slide here is um, Priya Dante from class of 2015. She just completed a PhD in, um, in computer science and is starting a new faculty position as an assistant professor at MIT. And she co-founded Climate Change AI. And so and actually she's been helping us get the word out about the open position at the intersection of computer science and climate. I'm very proud of Priya. Speaking of which, so uh, faculty are of course the in one way is the center of the student experience at Harvey Mudd because courses are in some ways the center of the student experience at Harvey Mudd. And we've always had faculty interested in climate and environment, but now we are adding faculty whose primary teaching obligations will be in these fields, which is new. I'm the first one, the Hickson Professor of Climate Studies. And as I said, my focus is in atmospheric chemistry, air pollution and its impact on climate. This year, we're searching for two professors, one at the intersection of mathematics and climate, and one um, at the intersection of computer science and climate. And we're hoping to add five more faculty in some small number of years so that we can have a cross uh, jointly appointed faculty member with each of our seven departments. And so with, you know, with each new faculty person, we get new courses, new research opportunities for students to get engaged in, in those activities, and also mentoring, because the faculty-student relationships at Harvey Mudd are very special, um, and the more faculty we have, the more opportunities there are for students to be part of these research teams. So here's my team, my seniors that graduated last year, and they all worked with me, and it's a really special thing for faculty members, too. We also uh, support through the Hickson Center our existing faculty. So we want to bring new faces onto campus, bring new expertise, but we recognize that our faculty have a lot of capacity to contribute to um, solutions and to, to understanding climate change broadly. We have a lot of interest from our existing faculty. And so one model that we've been um, in conversation with departments for is to have this rotating a contribution to the center where a faculty member might get a course reduction or two from their home department, have some time and space within the Hickson Center to maybe create something as small as a fraction of a course to uh, launch a new research program or design new courses. And that once those things have been designed, those faculty member will return to their department with their normal teaching load, but they'll bring all of that back into the courses that students are already um, taking. And that will add a richness to the curriculum that we couldn't do with just bringing new faces onto campus. We talk with the students and with our colleagues a lot about climate literacy. And I like this because um, this framework is broader than just understanding the greenhouse effect, which is, of course, part of understanding what's happening with climate change and appears under the physical sciences, um, carbon cycles and oceans and atmospheres and those kinds of things. But if you want to understand climate change in 2022 and beyond, you really need quite a bit more um, in terms of a background, a broad background. And so there's really important roles to be played uh, with mathematics and computational sciences, modeling, machine learning, um, remote sensing, as I said before, of course, engineering, all the design aspect of what future technologies are going to look like. And then our humanities, social sciences, and the arts program offers enormous breadth for our students to understand how their big ideas intersect with history, law, policy, economics, art, literature, everything, all of the above. 
In fact, this semester we have a course on uh, literature and environmental crisis being offered by one of the faculty in the HSA department. So lots of really interesting things happening there too. In terms of courses that are fed just from the Hickson Center at the moment and in the near future, we have um, a few courses here in the black box. So I have taught um, a global climate change course at the introductory level. I'm currently teaching climate science and human behavior. Um, this is a seminar style course that's co-taught with a psychology professor. We've had a modern atmospheric chemistry course and a new core course, uh, STEM and Society Climate Change, which will um, which has been approved and will live for at least the next handful of years, if not much longer, uh, on the theme of climate change. And it's, it serves as a sort of a capstone for our core curriculum for students to bring together a lot of the skills and knowledge they see in the core to deeply to understand climate change. We're hoping with the new faculty to bring in um, new courses, uh, most importantly, a Climate Science 101 and 102, sort of a, a kernel for the joint majors and for other students too. Specialty courses, of course, at the intersection of those um, fields, math and climate, CS and climate, as well as the additional hires that we have, and um, likely a new air quality and data science course. The colleges offer many, many more courses beyond these in the, in the fields of environment and climate. These are just the courses that we're launching from this structure from the Hickson Center. So we also have something very exciting for our community, and this is open to including to parents to join if you'd like to join um, uh, virtually for our speaker series, you're welcome to do so. We have the Nelson series, which is a campus-wide speaker series. And this year it's hosted jointly by the Hickson Center for Climate and the Environment and the Hickson Riggs Program for Responsive Science, which is out of the HSA department. We are hosting a theme on climate storytellers because storytelling is one of the most important and most impactful ways to increase engagement, concern, action, um, and progress on climate change. So we have a series of four speakers. Ayanna Elizabeth Johnson is a PhD in marine biologist. Um, she's most famous for her podcast, How to Save a Planet, and an anthology she's co-edited. She's written many op-eds on this. And we also have another scientist, Catherine Hayhoe, who's the chief scientist at the Nature Conservancy, and she's a physical climate scientist. She does, um, uh, extreme event modeling out of Texas Tech. And she's well known for her work on climate communication broadly across religious and political boundaries. She's excellent at that. We also have um, a historian, Naomi Oreskes, and a novelist, Amitav Ghosh. He's a highly decorated fiction and nonfiction writer. He's also a social anthropologist, and he writes about the intersection of climate change and colonialism. And Naomi Oreskes is um, quite famous for her work, uh, Merchants of Doubt, uh, which is also a film, and uh, the sort of consensus studies when you say 97% of scientists agree that uh, climate change is happening and it's us, she does those type of studies. So she's really been an advocate for spreading the news about scientific consensus and also calling out climate misinformation at the highest levels. I wanted to talk briefly about the climate science um, plus X joint majors that we are developing because that's something that students will be very interested in. So there are a number of existing undergraduate programs broadly in this area, and they fall into three buckets. Some programs are more um, energy focused and they usually are housed in engineering departments. There's also traditional earth science programs that might be in like a geology department and then broadly environmental studies, which can be its own department um, and is uh, often heavily influenced by biological sciences and um, environmental analysis or HSA type fields. The type of institutions that might have similar programs that maybe um, some of your students considered going to where they chose to go to MUD are listed here. We've been looking at what other schools are doing so that we can ensure that our program is uh, competitive and recruits the best students to Harvey MUD. And among those institutions, this is a distribution that we see and what types of programs folks are creating. So about um, 31 out of 35, so nearly all those institutions have an environmental studies program, and then smaller and smaller fractions have the more technical programs with only 10 institutions having something that is probably closer to what we would imagine um, with more uh, energy focus and engineering. 
Ours is a little bit different. So it, at Harvey Mudd, every student can pursue climate because of the joint major program. They won't have to declare this as their primary major. They'll be partnering with an existing major, which will really give them depth in whatever they choose. If it's physics, mathematics, computer science, chemistry, they will have the depth in that area to pursue careers in that field um, as they would have if they weren't going to do the joint major. But they will also have breadth in both climate science and climate solutions, um, given the courses that we're going to be offering that will overlap with their other fields. Our program is also unique because we have close student faculty interactions. Most of the energy, energy and engineering programs are at large institutions where you don't tend to have the close interpersonal re, uh, interactions between students and faculty. We also have 10 courses, of course, in the HSA fields, which is another unique aspect combined with the strong technical background they get from the core and beyond. And our students have a capstone experience with industry or faculty mentors, which again is hard to manage at a large institution um, where you have so many students relative to the number of faculty. And you may have heard a little bit about Capstone. You'll probably hear more depending on the age of your student and, and how they're progressing through the curriculum. We have two flavors of Capstone. One is clinic, and that's with um, a team of students will work with an industry partner over the course of a year on a problem of choosing by the client and they will um, have a technical advisor from that, that partner. And here are some examples of industry partners. We also have thesis where students will work on, for example, my research program or Tom's research program. They'll work with us in our labs, be trained um, to do the work that we do and partner with us on projects that we have running. This is one of my thesis students from uh, last year. We're really excited at the Hickson Center to announce that we have funding from the Fletcher Jones Foundation to sponsor in perpetuity to endow a climate clinic, which allows us to partner with um, organizations that might not otherwise be able to afford the clinic fee because these industry partners do pay the college for the work that students do with them. And one of the biggest demands we have from our students is for more clinics that are pointed at climate or environment. And so we now can, um, we can offer this at least one per year. We hope to have more of these in the future. A few people have asked us um, what success looks like for the Hickson Center as we're fundraising and, and growing our program and building our planned joint majors. And we believe that in a handful of years, we will have fully endowed a Hickson faculty cohort. We will have joint majors with most or all the departments. It will be up to departments to partner with us, but we have lots of positive energy and enthusiasm from our colleagues. We believe our alumni will take on leadership roles in climate solutions. We're seeing it already, even without the joint major. So we know we're just gonna have even more of this. And that students at MUD, all of them, because of the new impact course, will leave with a little bit more climate literacy than they otherwise would have. And a lot of students will be completely literate in this problem. They'll have taken multiple courses. We hope that we'll have a reputation for a forward-looking, technically strong climate program because of the students going out in the world and doing amazing things as, as they always have done. And that we'll have some industry partners in the clean tech space as well, um, and perhaps an active entrepreneurship program in climate tech, which I think hits a sweet spot for the college. So that was a lot of information and not a lot of time. Um, we wanted to reserve the rest of the time today for Q&A, um, but if you do have questions, you can reach out to me directly, hawkins at g.hmc.edu. You can also visit the Hickson Center webpage and check out the content that's being um, uploaded daily, I think. We're, we're making changes right now. It's an active process, so um, keep checking back on the website if you want to know what's going on. So I'm going to stop uh, screen sharing and um, well, I guess Vanessa will help us with the Q&A. Yes. So if you have any questions, please uh, put it in the Q&A box and then we will answer as many as we can. We do have a few pre-submitted questions, so I will start off with that. Uh, are there opportunities for students interested in the intersection of engineering and environment slash climate science? Do you want to have me to answer that, Tom, or do you want to take that one? Okay, um, I'll answer that one. So yes, absolutely. We have actually just hired two new faculty into the engineering department. I always like to plug our new faculty because they're going to be looking for research students um, and students to sign up for their classes. One is already on campus. We have an environmental engineer, Whitney Fowler, who's um, studying water 
and, um, and materials to, for environmental engineering purposes. And then we have Dre Helms, who is looking at heat pumps and heat pump technology, which is a really important technology that we should all be having in our homes as we move forward to get off of fossil fuels and heating. So that would be the type of um, research that students in engineering could get it, could get um, involved in directly. I also hire engineering students in my lab. I have two three, two or three right now. I've had two or three in the past. And so um, engineering students are very useful, I will say. <laughs> I really appreciate having them. And then in terms of courses, uh, both Dre and Whitney will teach electives in their specialties. And we also have courses like material science engineering. We have material science of energy conversion and storage, a specific course that's taught across three departments to look at that exact question. And um, broadly, students uh, in engineering have a little bit of room for electivity, and they sometimes will take an elective you know, of mine in climate, for example. So. Great, thank you. Our next question, what types of jobs are there to, to fight climate change that MUD students can work towards? I know you mentioned a little bit earlier. Yeah, so I think what I can add to that from the presentation is our plan for creating the joint major is for it to be sort of foundational and flexible. And so we, we want to ensure is that no matter what a student wants to do, that the kernel of the joint major will support that work and will ensure some, some level of familiarity and technical depth in the climate problem so they can move outward. But then with advising, we can help them be prepared for graduate school, which might require an extra course in fluid dynamics, for example, or an extra math course, um, or more courses in atmospheric science, versus a student who wants to go work and be a sustainability officer, and maybe they want to take um, economics courses or um, policy courses, for example. So, so we would be advising students to shape their electives for the future that they want. But I imagine our students will be spreading themselves out broadly between academic work, between um, activism and advocacy, and then in the climate tech space. And I don't actually know which way it's gonna fall. Um, it's really an interesting thought experiment, but I, I, I'm guessing one third, one third, one third among the folks that, that move in this area, because there's a lot of room for innovation and there's a lot of money flowing into uh, climate and climate solutions at the moment. Do you want to add to that, um, Tom, anything? Oh, sounds great. Yeah, isn't that great? In my head, yeah. it's fantastic. Yeah. I know, <laughs> let's, let's do this. Yeah, it's awesome. Um, so we have one more question. So the need for alternative fields is so urgent. Which types can MUD students learn about and do research for? Yes, excellent. So I, I will plug for just a second our uh, core chemistry course, which has a unit called the Tesla versus Toyota Smackdown. Um, one of our chemists created this. He does research in, um, in alternative methods of solar energy conversion. So not silicon-based solar cells. He's been working with dye-sensitized solar cells and quantum dots. Um, he's always changing. So I think those are the latest two. Um, and these are more cheaply made solar cells at lower energy intensity. So he has created a module for our first year students where they see the difference between fuel cells and um, traditional um, uh, electric, you know, electric vehicles with um, batteries. And so they'll learn a little bit about alternative fuels in that in that course. And then we have the material science of energy conversion and storage. So that'll be an advanced course for juniors and seniors on um, some of the more detailed physics and chemistry of, of solar energy. And, but also wind, I think appears in their alternative energy. Our climate solutions course would probably be the, the biggest concentrated place for this. So that's uh, 102, we're calling it. After students take the basic introduction to the climate system, they then move into a course that is going to look at adaptation and mitigation, essentially. And that will be part of the mitigation coursework. But I imagine our new faculty will also create other specialty courses, maybe half courses, to think about um, alternative energy and I um, would believe that our new faculty, Dre Helms, might be part of that. Great, thank you. Um, that is all that I have for pre-submitted questions. Um, I don't have any questions in the Q&A at this point, but I do have a question for both of you. Um, what are you most excited about the Hickson Center? 
Well, I, I'm excited about the hiring of new faculty. You know, whenever you try to create something at a college or a university, you know, foundationally, if you want that thing to last, to be a permanent part of the institution, it's got to be buried in the faculty, in the curriculum that students can be offered. And so shortly before I arrived, the college did not have a biology department or a computer science department, which seems unimaginable to anybody who visits the college now. And it is, it's my hope that in 20 years, the, the presence of the Hickson Center and all the faculty who are involved in it and all the joint major programs and all the work that's being done in the classroom and the research lab and the clinics, it will be unimaginable to the, the broader community that there was a time when we didn't have this kind of curriculum and, and activity at the college. Yeah, I would have said the same thing as Tom, but I'll offer another answer um, to make it more interesting, which is I'm very excited for our students to who are passionate about this problem to see someone other than a chemist <laughs> and maybe a physicist, but they identify me most strongly to see someone other than a chemist who is working on this. So they, um, those of the students that are not chemists can really see themselves in this solution space because when we bring in new faculty, faculty are in some ways role models for students. And I'm really excited for our engineering students and our CS students and our math students to have someone who's taking those fields um, and pointing them at this area and our students can, can find the intersection of their passions. Great, hey, thank you. Our next question, uh, will some or all of these courses be made available to students from the other Claremont colleges? Yes. <laughs> yes. yes we, yeah, we, we certainly hope so. Um, we, it would be great. You know, the, the consortium of the five colleges with seven colleges is a really strong part of what we can do. We can offer a much broader range of uh, classes if we can all rely on each other. And so uh, already we have students who are taking our climate offerings, you know, the, some of the courses that Lily has listed, some of the courses I've taught in the past, they all, they always attract students from the other campuses and that's a real strength. So that, we, and in fact, we're, uh, Claremont McKenna College is starting an, uh, inter uh, sorry, a, a new computational sciences program and we're talking with them, we're actively talking with them about the ability for us to sort of maybe rely on each other to teach certain courses in our curriculum. A part of that, a, one of the, the three legs of their curriculum is going to involve climate. And so that'll be a, a heavy overlap between us and them. And so we're talking to them about how we might partner to do some of that work. Yeah. And, and when we design the prerequisites for these courses, we keep the other campuses in mind. So we would always have pathways for students from the other campuses to come and join our courses. It's better for everyone if there's crosstalk among the, the five colleges. And so, yeah. yes. <laughs> Is the short answer. Thank you. Uh, our next question, is there any chance that the intro climate course could be required as part of the core curriculum given the urgency of the problem? You want this one, Lilia? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if it's a vote for two. Um, so in some ways we have done this because we've just approved the impact class with the uh, focus on climate change. So we have uh, this impact course sits in the very end of the core. It is part of the core. It's the, in the fourth semester, so the spring of the sophomore year. And the students will see um, some of the physical science of climate, um, you know, not as much as they would see in a whole semester long course on the physical science of climate, but quite a bit in that course. And they will also see other fields. Um, we have some physics, we have mathematics, we have art, we have history of science, all looking at the climate problem and the focus is on solutions. And that's a, a, right now the model that we're using, students have a project where they do a climate solutions project toward the end of the semester. So in some ways we have done this. Um, and I guess I can imagine a future where Climate 101 um, becomes part of the core, but the trend in recent years has been to be more flexible and to shrink the core, not to grow it. So that would have to be um, a conversation later. Perfect, thank you. Um, in light of the new Inflation Reduction Act, Act, how do you find academic and research clinic thesis opportunities changing or evolving? Also, thanks, looks like a great program and great program design. Thank you. Do you wanna, do you have an answer, Tom? Well, one of the things, I, I think it's a little early 
to know in detail how the, the Inflation Reduction Act is actually going to impact us. It's, what's clear is there's going to be a lot of money flowing into this space. And um, so we'll see how that exactly plays out. One of, one of the things that caught my eye recently was that the National Science Foundation, who is a primary funder of basic research um, in the United States. So it's uh, funded by the federal government and it, its mission is to promote a fundamental research. And they've just opened a new directorate. So a whole new area that they're funding, which and I, I apologize, I've forgotten the acronym, but the idea is to bring technological solutions forward, sort of an entrepreneurial technology and bring solutions forward, particularly in this climate space to help solve the climate problem. So that's that's one very specific thing that I suspect we will see faculty at Harvey Mudd vectoring towards in terms of funding and research opportunities? I think broadly, um, this is the beginning of a large influx of money, public and private, uh, toward climate solutions, climate tech policies, uh, better information gathering. And so lots and lots of companies are going to need better information about their own emissions, their own footprint, and that's going to put a demand on um, on people with the background that our students are going to have to contribute to that, as well as you can imagine um, climate projections for companies, right? So company X wants to have a new warehouse. Should it be in Miami or in Colorado or in Minnesota? You know, um, so I think the market for students with our background is going to explode, and part of it is the Inflation Reduction Act, and part of it is just the way that the um, that the climate problem is evolving so quickly. More and more people are realizing that there's there's going to be change, and they want to be ready for that in a business sense. Thank you. Our next question, uh, will there be any courses or discussion within courses about communicating climate science work or research? Yes, so that appears in the impact course that we were talking about, the new core curriculum. There is a day, a specific plenary day that's called Communicating Climate. It is certainly the theme of the Nelson series this year and Climate Storytellers. It's a big passion of mine personally, which is why I co-developed the Climate Science and Human Behavior class, which isn't is about communication, but it's about basing your the way that you communicate on the science of behavioral science rather than how you think people should be communicated to or what you find convincing yourself personally. That's irrelevant. Um, we have behavioral science studies and more and more that tell us how we should be as uh, climate scientists, for example, talking about climate change to broader audiences to increase engagement. And it's not always what you would think. So um, that's one example of one course that I'm teaching, but I bring that into the other courses that I teach. My, my freshman elective that I was teaching, that was um, a focus for a few days on that as well. And the students wanna talk about it too. I don't know about other courses beyond that, but I know we have uh, communicating science broadly um, in, in a number of courses. There's Math Forum, for example, which is a, a course and giving presentations run by the mathematics department. It's very popular. Tom, do you have anything? Yeah, I was, I was just, nothing in detail, but I was just gonna sort of commend the question, Stephanie, because the that, that question is, is great at a number of levels because I think as we all know, the science of climate change is, is well understood and that we have means of sort of solving it if we would just act. And then the question becomes, why aren't we acting? Why aren't we acting in the United States? Why aren't we acting in different parts of the world? You know, there's lots of different answers to that question, which depend on exactly where you are. But for instance, in the United States, why aren't we doing more? We know the science. We know what some solutions that are available to us today could be. And that gets to the heart of communicating sort of about climate and its impacts on people and the economy and sort of everyday life and how to, as Lily was saying, frame this and talk about it in a way that's meaningful to people so that we can act at a, in an economic and political sphere also. Great, thank you. Um, that concludes our questions at this point. Um, Lilia, Tom, do you have any um, things that, you know, last statements you wanna make before we close this up? Or maybe I'll trigger some questions. 
I would just say thank you for all of our attendees for being so invested in, in Harvey Mudd and your students' education and um, what we're doing here. And we invite you to continue to learn more when you come to campus. Um, please, you know, come by, say hello. I'm in the Olin building. Tom's a little harder. He's in the ivory tower, but, um, but you can certainly right. come by the, the Olin Hickson Center and walk around, say hello, um, send us emails. You, you know, there's no reason to be shy. We're happy to chat, send your students over, talk to us. Um, and if you have suggestions, questions, comments, they're always welcome. Oh, how many, oh, that's a question for you, I guess, uh, Vanessa. Yeah, so how many attendees we have currently online right now? We have about 20, so that's pretty good. Yeah, I would just say what Lily said, thank you so much for being here. Thank you for your interest and the time and engaging with us in the college. It's, uh, it's, it's It means a great deal. Thank you. Great. Well, I want to thank Tom and Lilia for joining us today and for sharing, you know, information about the Hickson Center with us. Thank you to our audience for your questions and for attending this event. Future events can be found on our website by visiting alumni.hmc.edu. Uh, thanks again for joining us and have a great night. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.